Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled Crash of the B1A, August 29th, 1984. Now, there were four B1As produced, and these were flown and in flight test while I was out at Edwards uh, during my tour there in the late 70s, and I've chased all these aircraft. And unfortunately, this crash resulted in the uh, death of one very experienced, very senior test pilot. This was supposed to be just a routine test. They were going to be doing some uh, low speed handling quality tests, but as any test pilot knows, there is no such thing as an easy routine test. Now, Doug Benefield was a super guy, very experienced. He was 55 years old at the time of his death. Um, he had flown 176 combat missions in the F-4C uh, in Vietnam. He made uh, all the early B-1 uh, test flights, and this is the B-1A. He also spent four years as a test pilot for the FAA, and he retired from the Air Force as a colonel in 73, and he also was involved in testing the uh, Concorde uh, for France. Now, also aboard uh, this aircraft during the accident event was uh, Major Richard Reynolds, 35, an Air Force pilot, and uh, Otto Wanacek, uh, 30, a flight test engineer uh, from Seattle. And as I said, this was supposed to be the third of a low-speed uh, test and an easy test flight. Now, they often use the F-111 to chase the B-1, as it depicted in this photograph, because uh, the F-111 just had great uh, range and endurance capability and speed capability that matched the B-1s uh, very well. Uh, we had four F-111s out at Edwards at the time, and keeping uh, more than two of them uh, flight-ready was, uh, was quite a challenge. So uh, it was the preferred aircraft to chase the B-1, but we had 20 T-38s, and that was kind of the fallback chase aircraft for everything. So if you didn't have an F-111, you had to do a chase mission, uh, you sent up the T-38. So I got to chase the uh, the B-1 a number of times in the T-38s, but typically we had to use several T-38s because they just, uh, if they're doing anything high speed at all, which a lot of the work was high speed, uh, they just ran the T-38s out of gas in no time. Now, this test mission was uh, being flown north of Harper Dry Lake, and uh, they were uh, transferring fuel to do the, the various test missions, and uh, they had a, a master caution light that they had um, uh, an issue with the center of gravity. Uh, they didn't get a light that indicated that the fuel had not transferred, and they attribute pilot error to the fact that the, uh, the fuel was out of balance um, and... Uh, uh, although they, they had gotten a warning on this, uh, the fuel was out of balance. And when they swung the wings forward to um, do the low speed handling test, uh, the airplane uh, reared up. They were at, uh, at 4,200 feet at the time, which is reasonably low, but you have to conduct the, uh, the test at the appropriate altitude uh, for the air density that you're trying to achieve. So uh, when the wings were swept forward, the uh, B1 reared up to a 90 degree angle uh, and the, uh, the airplane uh, stalled uh, and it started to tumble and spin. Okay, you're in a B1, you're in a spin at roughly 4,200 feet. This isn't a good deal at all. The, uh, the chase radioed uh, to the B1 uh, uh, to, to specifically to Doug. Doug was in the co-pilot position, but he was uh, obviously the, the, the senior guy on the flight. Uh, and uh, the chase uh, pilot said, uh, how are you doing, Doug? And Doug replied, we may have to punch it. We have to punch. And at 1,515 feet above the ground, okay, you're in a spin in a B-1 at 1,500 feet, uh, the command pilot, Richard Reynolds, said, we got to get out, and he pulled the uh, ejection handle uh, that uh, fired the escape capsule. Now, the B-1 has a very interesting escape capsule. It's kind of like the F-111, if you're familiar with that, but much larger, and it can take out all four crew members. And, I mean, this is a massive uh, escape capsule. And uh, some of the early uh, test bed uh, videos are very quite interesting to watch. But uh, uh, when it fired, they uh, had a failure of an explosive bolt. And it's, uh, it's meant to go out 
uh, you know, at, at high and low speed. Initially, the chutes come out directly behind you to slow it down to your high speed, but they're immediately supposed to reef and they're supposed to bring the capsule down in a level attitude and their airbags under the capsule that deploy that help reduce the landing shock. Now, because this bolt didn't fire, the uh, chute lines did not uh, properly uh, reef to give a level descent. And when the aircraft uh, hit, the, um, it hit on the right side at a very steep angle. Um, and uh, Doug Benefield was killed on impact. His seat ripped away from the floor of the capsule due to the 40G impact forces. And uh, it was kind of interesting. The other two crew members were seriously injured. Wanachek, who was the flight test uh, pilot, was not wearing his helmet nor strapped to his seat. And he suffered a partial collapse of both lungs. And Reynolds was temporary, temporarily paralyzed uh, with um, back injuries. Now, this is a picture of uh, the capsule after it, you know, it hit on its nose and it, it, it fell back vertically. But uh, the B-1 had a lot of fuel on board and uh, a very significant fire uh, developed. And because they ejected at such a low altitude, of course, the capsule did not land far from the wreckage site and the fire was starting to engulf the capsule. Now, what's interesting is uh, the B-1 crashed uh, six miles um, southwest uh, from the Moron Federal Prison that was out there. And they had an agreement, since uh, the area was fairly isolated, uh, they had a fire company there, and uh, it was uh, composed of inmates, and if you had a fire within a 25-mile radius, because of the remoteness of the area, they would dispatch the inmates to fight the fire. And they had three fire trucks they sent out, but uh, four fire trucks, excuse me, that they sent out, but three of them were uh, disabled <laughs> due to the rough terrain. And Steve Arlington, he was then inmate and chief engineer uh, in charge, um, he was a uh, ex-Navy uh, explosive ordnance uh, individual, and uh, he knew this could be a very dangerous situation. He thought initially it was a B-52 that went down, but realized as he came up that it was a B-1 capsule that he was uh, looking at. And they saw the fire was starting to engulf the, um, the capsule. And, of course, the guys are inside. So he goes up there and he starts uh, dousing water uh, and foam on the capsule. Uh, they, couldn't, they didn't have enough with only the one out of the four trucks to take care of the uh, burning bomber. But the main thing was to, to get the guys safe. And they were able to, uh, to put the fire out around the, uh, the capsule and extradate the uh, pilots uh, from it successfully. Now this is a crash site and some of the remains of the B-1 bomber. Now the Air Force of course investigated it and Reynolds and Wanachek told investigators they didn't recall seeing the warning lights indicating the fuel had not shifted. However the investigation uncovered that the two master warning lights uh, were uh, properly working um, and that the center of gravity warning light did function. Uh, key to the discussion was the crew's responsibility uh, to use the automatic system that normally transferred fuels, and it was disengaged because uh, the test flight called for manual control. And Benefield was supposed to uh, turn a knob to uh, actuate the, the process. The Air Force attributed the crash to be caused by human error. Um, as the uh, plane's movable wings were swung forward uh, for lower altitude test, Benefield apparently forgot to switch the mechanism that shifts fuel among the various tanks. Uh, this caused the uh, nose to shift upwards and the plane to stall and spin. And uh, basically the uh, Brigadier General uh, Schofener, who headed the investigation, said it was human error. They did not shift the center of gravity. Uh, the board also blamed uh, equipment failure, namely the failure of an explosive bolt for the co-pilot, Doug Benefield's death, after the uh, ejection in a parachute-equipped escape capsule. And this is the, uh, the crash site. It's interesting. Um, in February of 1985, uh, Doug's widow uh, successfully uh, sued um, 
Ordnance Engineering Associates and was awarded $1.4 million uh, because they uh, they manufactured the escape capsule parachutes uh, firing mechanism uh, that failed. Uh, there, there's also uh, another interesting uh, uh, note here that um, uh, Richard Reynolds, who was the uh, co-pilot, he uh, went on to command the uh, flight test center at Edwards in 1998 and retired in uh, 2005 at the rank of Ru Lieutenant General and uh, as the vice commander of the Air Force uh, Materials Command. Stephen Arnold, who had been jailed in 82 for cross-country cocaine smuggling trip, allegedly uh, connected to automate or, uh, John DeLorean, was released in 85. He joined the Cousseau Society as chief diver and expedition leader and later a full-time lay youth minister, motivational speaker, and author writing about his experiences as an inmate firefighter in the book In DeLorean's Shadow. So that was a, that was a rather interesting career for that individual. Now here is an aerial picture of the crash site uh, much later the, uh, of the B-1A here. Now the interesting thing about this uh, and the desert out at Edwards is uh, these disturbances to the desert floor last a very long time because there isn't much out there uh, to disturb things. So um, you can have crashes from decades earlier that you can find because the, the crash site is still rather uh, disturbed. And uh, I know people go out there with metal detectors and find pieces of aircraft that have crashed um, much, much earlier. But one thing I might mention, I, I talk about the escape capsule. This was only for the B-1A models, the original four test aircraft. Later they determined uh, it was too complicated, heavy structure, whatever. They, they just decided uh, not to go with the escape capsule and then they went to uh, individual ejection seat. So uh, this was an escape mechanism that only existed for the A models and didn't find itself going into production. And finally, this is a picture of the B-1 test team patch. And there is my B-1 test team patch. Um, I, didn't, I didn't wear this patch because I wasn't on the test team, but I got it from one of the, uh, the test pilots uh, there. And uh, this test pilot, uh, this test patch is kind of historic because you can see it's, it's very well worn. And I guess you would expect that sort of wear because this, this, this uh, patch has gone supersonic. Um, so it's got a lot of wear and tear on a lot of through, uh, through a lot of test missions and, uh, has quite a, has had quite a few missions on the B1. So I hold this, uh, patch in rather great esteem. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you found it informative.